Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Warden Johnston sat at his desk across from one of his prison guards, who sat looking shamefully at the floor. He was speechless. This was the third guard this month who was resigning from his position due to the fear of a ghost woman. You're a grown man, the warden barked. There's no such thing as ghosts. I don't even have to tell my grandchildren that. Even they know better. The guard wouldn't make eye contact with the warden, probably too ashamed. The warden dismissed the man and sat alone in the empty room for a while, contemplating. He reached into his desk drawer and pulled out his bottle of vintage brandy. Pouring himself a glass, he laughed out loud, considering the situation. Three guards in one month, leaving their secure jobs in the middle of the Great Depression because they're afraid of ghosts. Absurd, he said to himself. It was late. He was usually home by this time. But this nonsense with the cowardly guard forced him to stay late. He finished his brandy, grabbed his coat and hat, and walked out of the office. As he headed down the dimly lit prison hallway, wondering what Ida May might be cooking for dinner that he was undoubtedly late for, his thoughts were interrupted by a faint sound coming from the other end of the corridor. He stopped in his tracks and listened. It sounded like crying, he thought. Odd. He began walking towards the sound, and as he got closer, it grew louder. It sounded like a crying woman. There shouldn't be any women here at this hour, he said out loud to nobody. He kept walking down the hallway towards the sound. Suddenly, a gust of cold air rushed by him as if someone opened a door during a snowstorm. Except there was no open door, nor was there a snowstorm. Who's there? He called out loud. The sound was unmistakable at this point. It was definitely a woman, and she was definitely crying. But there was no woman, and the hallway ended. Dead end. Just bricks. No window, no door, and the crying was coming from inside the wall. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Alcatraz. In 1775, Juan Manuel de Ayala, a Spanish naval officer and explorer, sailed to San Francisco Bay, mapping out the area for the first time. He noted three islands on the bay. One of those would become known as Alcatraz. The first known owner of Alcatraz was Julian Workman. In June of 1846, the island was given to him by his friend and Mexican governor, Pio Pico. The two men had agreed that Workman could have the island under the condition that he constructed a lighthouse. The island would be sold to John C. Fremont later that year for $5,000 in the name of the United States government, who would never pay Fremont for the island despite years of legal battles lasting into the 1890s. In 1850, the island was set aside for a possible location for a U.S. military reservation via presidential order. During the California Gold Rush, with the predictable economic boost in and around San Francisco, the U.S. Army built a fortress at the top of the island to protect the bay. In total, they installed 105 cannons, making Alcatraz the most heavily fortified military site on the west coast. The fortification of Alcatraz would add to the planned triangle of defense in the bay, along with Fort Point and Lime Point, but the plans to fortify Lime Point would never come to pass. By the late 1850s, military prisoners began to be transferred and housed on the island. During the Civil War era, massive changes to artillery and fortification were generated to modify the fortress. Plans to level the entire island and construct shell-proof underground tunnels were undertaken in the 1870s, but were never completed. In 1867, the brick jailhouse was built. Previously, inmates were housed in the basement of the guardhouse. The need for Alcatraz to be used as a defensive fort diminished over time, and for the next 100 years, it would serve as a prison. In 1898, during the Spanish-American War, the population of the prison skyrocketed from 26 prisoners to over 450. After the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, civilian prisoners were transferred to Alcatraz. In 1909, the army tore down the citadel, leaving its basement level to serve as the foundation for a new military prison. Over the next two years, military prisoners would build the massive concrete main cell block, designed by Major Reuben Turner. The first floor served as the basement to the new cell block. 
which would become known as the Dungeons. During World War I, Alcatraz was used to hold conscientious objectors. One of those prisoners was Philip Grosser, who wrote a pamphlet titled Uncle Sam's Devil's Island about his stay at the prison. On October 12, 1933, the island was transferred to the U.S. Department of Justice to be used by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The federal government turned into a maximum security, minimum privilege penitentiary. Landmarks on the island include the first operational lighthouse on the west coast of the United States, a dining hall, the warden's house and social hall, parade grounds, Building 64, a water tower, new industries building, model industries building, a rec yard, and the main house. At 9.40 a.m. on August 11, 1934, 137 prisoners were escorted in high security coaches guarded by 60 FBI agents, railway security officials, and U.S. Marshals. The prisoners were mostly made up of notorious murderers and bank robbers. Some of the more infamous inmates included notorious gangsters George Machine Gun Kelly, Al Scarface Capone, and Bumpy Johnson. The majority of these prisoners were not well-known gangsters, but mostly inmates who refused to conform to the rules and regulations at other prisons. They were considered violent and dangerous. There were also several inmates who had either previously attempted or successfully escaped from other prisons. Over the 29 years that the island served as a federal prison, there would be a total of 14 escape attempts by 36 men, two who attempted to escape twice. 23 men would be caught, at least two would drown, and six would be shot and killed during their escape. The first attempt was in 1936. Joe Bowers climbed over a fence at the island's edge while working his job burning trash at the incinerator. He was spotted by a correctional officer in the West Road guard tower and ordered to climb down. The officer shot Bowers after he refused, and he fell 100 feet to his death on the shore below. On December 16, 1937, Ralph Rowe and Theodore Cole filed through the flat iron bars on a window on the Model Industries building where they worked at a mat shop. They made their way to the shore and presumably were swept out to sea as there was a bad storm raging that night. In 1938, Jimmy Lucas, Rufus Franklin, and James Limerick attacked and killed Royal Klein, a correctional officer. They climbed to the roof and attempted to disarm Harold Stites, the officer in the roof tower. Harold opened fire and shot two of the men. Limerick died from his gunshot wound, while Franklin and Lucas received life sentences for Klein's murder. In January of 1939, five men escaped from the isolation unit by sawing through the cell bars and bending toolproof bars on the window. They were spotted on the shoreline on the west side of the island. Arthur Doc Baker, one of the would-be escapees, was shot and killed when he refused to surrender. Dale Stamphill was also shot, but he would survive. The other men, William Martin, Henry, and Rufus McCain surrendered. On May 21, 1941, four inmates took several correctional officers hostage while working in the industry's area. The officers were able to convince the four men that they could not escape, and the inmates surrendered. Later that year, John Bayless attempted to escape and even made it into the water. He got cold, and he gave up. He would also try to escape a courtroom in San Francisco, but this attempt would also be unsuccessful. In April of 1943, Floyd Hamilton, James Borman, Fred Hunter, and Harold Brest took two officers hostage. They climbed out a window and made their way to the water's edge. One of the hostages alerted officers to the escapees and they opened fire on the three men who were already swimming away from the island. Brest and Hunter were apprehended, while Borman was hit by bullets and sank. His body was never found. Hamilton was presumed dead and he hid in a small cave on the island for two days. Eventually, he made his way back up to the industries area where he was discovered. That summer, Ted Walters escaped from a laundry building and was caught just before he could jump in the water. Arguably, one of the more clever attempts happened in June of 1945, when John Giles was able to take advantage of his job at the loading dock. Piece by piece, he stole an entire army uniform, put it on, and calmly walked aboard an army launch. They noticed he was missing, and unfortunately for him, the army launch was headed for Angel Island, not San Francisco. He was met by correctional officers at the island who promptly returned him to his cell. On May 2, 1946, six prisoners overpowered cellhouse officials and gained access to weapons and cellhouse keys. Their plan quickly fell apart when they noticed that they were missing the key to unlock the recreation yard door. Prison officials noticed what was going on and quickly tried to regain control of the cellhouse. The six men, Joe Kretzer, Marvin Hubbard, Bernard Coy, Marin Thompson, Clarence Carnes, and Sam Shockley stood their ground and fought. Officers were taken hostage and shot at point-blank range by Kretzer. Officer William Miller was shot and killed, and Harold Stites, mentioned earlier in the 1938 escape attempt, was also shot and killed. In total, 18 officers were injured during the battle. 
The fight raged on for two days and ended on May 4th when the U.S. Marines were called in to assist. Bernard Coy, Joe Kretzer, and Marvin Hubbard were killed in the fight. The three other men stood trial. Shockey and Thompson were charged for the death of the officers and received the death penalty. Carnes, who was only 19 years old, received his second life sentence. The escape attempt would become known as the Battle of Alcatraz. Ten years would go by before the next escape attempt on July 23, 1956, when Floyd Wilson disappeared while working his job on the dock. He was found a few hours later hiding among the rocks on the shoreline and he surrendered. Two years later, Aaron Burgett and Clyde Johnson overpowered an officer and made a swim for it. Johnson was caught in the water and Burgett escaped, but his body was found floating in the bay two weeks later. In 1962, there would be the final two escape attempts. One on December 16th, when John Paul Scott and Darrell Parker bent the bars of the kitchen window and made their way to the water. Parker was found almost immediately, and John would be found by a group of teenagers while on some rocks under the Golden Gate Bridge, suffering from shock and hypothermia. He was returned to Alcatraz after being treated at a military hospital. The other attempt was back on June 11th of that year, and this one, many believe, may have been the only successful escape from Alcatraz. On the morning of June 12, 1964, Alan West awoke in his cell, exhausted and defeated. For months, he had meticulously planned the escape for him and three other inmates. Their plan was like no other escape attempt. They had handcrafted and painted dummy heads, even gathering human hair from the barbershop floor, gluing it on top of the heads. They had drilled holes in the walls around the vents in their cells, making it possible to crawl through the holes, kicking out the weakened wall on that fateful night. They spent countless nights carving away at the wall with spoons and handmade knives. But what separated their plan from the others is they had a plan for when they reached the shoreline. They had stolen dozens of raincoats and handcrafted a raft to take them across the bay. They even modified an accordion to be used as a pump to keep the raft afloat. They used some of these raincoats to make life vests in case the raft sank. The other thing that separated their plan from the rest was arguably the most important, a head start. As soon as lights were out, they placed the dummies in their beds and made their way through the vents, climbing up the pipes to the roof through an air vent that they had previously removed while working in the area. Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, all met on the roof, life vests and raft in tow. But there were supposed to be four of them. Where was the mastermind of the entire plan, Alan West? Alan was back in his cell, frantically trying to remove the vent, but it wouldn't budge. He clawed at it, trying to get it to move, scraping and pulling at the vent until his hands were bleeding. But no luck. One of the England brothers made his way back down to West's cell and whispered to him from the other side of the vent. The two of them tried to get it loose, but they had no luck. Alan told him to go on without him, as it was nobody's fault but his own, that he didn't work harder previously to loosen the vent in time. A few hours later, West did in fact get the vent to budge, and he scrambled his way up the pipes, out the air vent on the roof, where he saw a single life vest, part of a raft, and a handcrafted oar waiting for him. He looked down at it and scanned the water, but the raft and the three men were gone. He contemplated throwing on the life vest and making a swim for it, but he had wasted too much time and feared that authorities would quickly catch up to him if he attempted the mile and a half swim to San Francisco. Defeated, he climbed back inside and went back to his cell. The next morning, as inmates were being lined up and counted, three men were missing from the line. Officers noted that Frank Morris was still sleeping. Something was off. He called to the officers that either Morris was dead in his bed or it wasn't a person at all. He reached into the cell poking the body. Then he reached in again and tapped the head. His fingers plunged through the plaster of the dummy's skull and it rolled onto the floor. Alarms were sounded as they noted that not just Frank but the Anglin brothers had escaped. A cell house search turned up the dummies, wall segments, tools, and makeshift drills. They vigorously searched the waters and found two life vests, oars, and a bag of belongings from one of the Anglin brothers. But they found no bodies and never found the pontoon-type raft that the inmates had made. Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin were officially listed as missing and presumed dead. At that time, two out of three people that went missing in San Francisco Bay would eventually be found. The fact that none of the bodies were ever recovered is either a statistical miracle or the bodies were never found because they didn't die. Many believe that the inmates dropped the bag of personal items on purpose to make authorities believe that they had drowned. A body was pulled from San Francisco Bay, but it was badly decomposed and unable to be identified. As months went by, many tips came in. Most of them proved to be useless. One lead was a postcard that was addressed to the warden and apparently signed by one of the escapees. Another lead was a phone call made to an attorney in San Francisco. 
The caller said his name was John Anglin, who agreed to surrender if he got his day in court. He wanted the lawyer, Leslie McGowan, to represent him. Leslie had represented an inmate from Alcatraz before and had gotten him freed. McGowan had become a bit of a celebrity among the inmates at Alcatraz, and investigators believed that Anglin may have gotten his name from someone inside. However, the lead went cold when the fugitive never called again. One family reported seeing a raft near the northern end of San Francisco Bay on the night of the escape. They said that a speedboat came by and may have picked the three men up. The FBI found nothing to support their story. It was illegal for any boat to be within 200 yards of the prison, but police records showed that on the night of the escape, there was a boat within a mile or two of the area. After some time, the boat turned its engine and lights on, turned away from the island, under the Golden Gate Bridge, and out to sea. A deeper investigation revealed that all four men had been studying Spanish in the weeks leading up to their escape, which led authorities to believe that they had planned to move south of the border if their escape was successful. The FBI closely monitored the Anglin family and kept watch on their mother's house, assuming that the fugitives would eventually show up, but they never did. When their mother died, police and FBI were waiting for the brothers at the funeral, but they didn't seem to show up. Or did they? Family members recognized everyone at the funeral, except for two mysterious women who were rather large and had their faces covered. When the funeral was finished, the two broad-shouldered, oddly-dressed women slipped away without talking to anyone, right past the FBI agents who were carefully examining all of the men in attendance. In 1992, Fred Brizzy, an old family friend, claimed that he ran into the Anglin brothers in Brazil, and he even had a photo of the brothers to prove it. The photo shows two men standing next to a massive anthill in 1975. The men looked remarkably like John and Clarence Anglin. Ken and David, both nephews of the Anglin brothers, confirmed that the two men in the photo were their uncles. So why did Fred wait nearly 20 years to show the photo to the family? He claimed that if he gave the information to the family sooner, authorities would have found out. He believed he was keeping the brothers safe by holding on to his secret. Brizzy died one year later. In 2015, Ken and David Widner offered to show the photo to investigators in exchange for a favor which had to do with their uncle Alfred Anglin. Alfred claimed that he had been in contact with John and Clarence and had planned to visit them when he himself got out of prison. A few days later, Alfred died on an electric fence while trying to escape. The family was suspicious. Why would he attempt to escape just days before his parole hearing? They suspected that prison officials had tried to get information on the Anglin brothers out of him, and when he didn't talk, they killed him. Ken and David contacted U.S. Marshal Investigator Roderick and shared their theories. They showed him the Christmas cards that they had been receiving from their uncles over the years, as well as the photograph of the two taken in 1975. Roderick didn't care much for the postcards, since they could have easily been fakes, but he was very interested in the photograph. They struck a deal, to have Alfred's body examined for signs of abuse in exchange for the photo. The body showed no signs of physical abuse, but they did take the opportunity to take his DNA and test it with the body that had been recovered on the night of the escape. The results showed that the body recovered from San Francisco Bay was not the Anglin brothers. They also tested it with Frank Morris's family DNA, and those results came back negative. The body that was recovered from San Francisco Bay after the escape was not one of the three escapees. Roderick had the photo from Fred Brezzi tested. A forensic artist found eight different points on each face that matched the Anglin brothers' mugshots and declared that the photo was highly likely to be John and Clarence. Months after the escape, Alcatraz closed its doors for good. In 1973, the prison became a popular tourist attraction with more than 1.3 million visitors each year. When the sun sets and the tourists leave, many believe that the ghosts of the prisoners remain. Long before the island was converted into a prison, Native Americans warned the U.S. Army not to build a fortress on the island as it was the dwelling place of evil spirits. Their warnings were ignored. In 1912, several soldiers were said to have been driven insane by mysterious noises in the night. They could see their breath, even on warm summer nights, and claimed to see the burning red eyes in the cells of the lower level. Inmates feared being thrown into the windowless cells of D-Block, where they claimed the red-eyed demon lurked, waiting to consume lost souls. In the 1940s, correctional officers threw a screaming inmate into solitary in 14D. He continued to scream throughout the night, claiming that a demon with red eyes was in the cell with him. He screamed that the beast was getting closer, eyes glowing. Then suddenly, the screaming stopped. Guards opened the doors to find the man dead on the floor, with clear markings around his throat. The autopsy revealed that the cause of death was non-self-inflicted strangulation. But the story doesn't stop there. 
According to sworn testimony from eyewitnesses, the next morning, when prisoners were lined up for roll call, the numbers didn't tally. There was an extra prisoner in line. A guard walked down the line, looking at each face to see if one of the inmates was pranking him. As he made his way down the line, he came face to face with the man who had been strangled and killed in the night. The ghost looked at him in the eyes and then vanished. The ghosts of would-be escapees haunt the hospital block where their bodies were taken. The cries of five inmates who committed suicide and eight inmates who were murdered at Alcatraz can be heard echoing throughout the hallways. Visitors claim to have seen cell doors close on their own. They have heard the sounds of sobbing, moaning, and disembodied footsteps walking the corridors. They have reported hearing screams from the ghosts of prisoners as if they're being beaten and tortured. Others claim to have seen a phantom soldier, as well as the ghostly full-bodied apparition of prisoners passing along the hallways and through solid walls. Investigators say that they feel as though they're being stared at by someone unseen inside empty cells. Some who have laid down on the bunks have found themselves pinned down, unable to get up. Cells 12 and 14 in D-Block are said to be some of the most haunted. Even the most skeptical of tourists report picking up feelings of despair, panic, and pain in these cells. Cold spots have been reported in cell 14D, registering 20 to 30 degrees colder than other cells in the block. One of the most notorious inmates at Alcatraz, Al Capone, was housed in cell B206, where he kept to himself mostly, some say strumming on a banjo from time to time. Visitors claim that if you listen closely, you sometimes hear his ghost playing popular songs from the 20s on his banjo. Reports of these songs can be heard from his cell, and others report hearing them in the showers. Rumor has it, he may not have been allowed to play guitar in his cell, so he had to practice in the showers. Capone notoriously claimed that he himself was haunted by one of his own victims, Jimmy, while at Alcatraz. And other inmates claimed that they could hear him begging the ghost to leave him alone. Spirits at the old warden's home on the island have been spotted as early as the 1940s. During a Christmas party at the house, several guards reported seeing the ghost of a man suddenly appear in front of them wearing a gray suit and hat. The ghost stared back at the astonished men for nearly a full minute before disappearing. The room went cold, and the fire in the Ben Franklin stove went out at the same time that the ghost vanished. Warden Johnston, who was a skeptic, reported hearing the ghostly wails of a woman coming from the walls. Several people he was with also heard the woman's cries. When the prison was in operation, guards reported hearing gunshots and cannon fire, accompanied by blood-curdling screams, sometimes so loud that the guards would hit the deck in a panic. In 1992, Sightings, a popular TV show about haunted places, visited the island. In their interviews with the staff, the crew was told about the unearthly screams, crashing sounds, footsteps, cell doors opening and closing on their own, the sounds of chains rattling, and they all claimed to have the constant feeling of being watched. up ladies and gentlemen welcome to hometown ghost stories episode number 35 alcatraz island san francisco bay california i'm jesse wilkins i'm joined by rob coakley what's up rob i just want one of my friends to give me an island like just once in my life that was pretty nice of him what a, yeah. what a gift i don't even think he built the lighthouse though i think that was constructed later so i don't think he pulled through with his part of the bargain wow <laughs> yeah we're also joined by dave wilkins what's going on dave what's going on <laughs> yeah, I like the that was a a cautious entry to not be too loud on the microphone. I like that. Yep. 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 <clears throat> Very good. Uh, I want to welcome everyone that's hanging out in live chat. Uh Cashers here on all of his accounts. Uh Irish Assassin has been uh playing his stream on our stream on his stream. So I appreciate that, my man. And then uh everyone else who's hanging out, we do appreciate you. Pam, welcome. Uh first time catching a live stream. There's a couple of people that were catching this for their first time. And Brandon that's very well. cool. For those who are uh, listening to the podcast. Uh, if you want to catch it live, every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is when we air the podcast uh, live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. So come help us anger Dave. That's like the point of this whole show is just to upset him. That's nobody why upsets I... me except for you, Rob. <laughs> Dave, has a, 
using a wider fisheye lens today on the webcam, and now right. I could see a creepy little skull figure to your right. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First ghost sighting. Uh, Spaguchi is also here. Oh, my God. I have a whole new view on Dave's house now. Yeah, that's right. So anyways, ah, so that's Alcatraz. That was a lengthy one, and I had actually shaved off about 10 minutes There's from that no episode. Way. That was because 24 was... hours long. How did you yeah. shave off time? We spent all day it. watching this episode. <laughs> I actually tried to escape from the episode. By... <laughs> Glad they, I held your interest. Jumped into the ocean. <laughs> they definitely escaped, right? Those three, like... I think so. so I think so. Yeah, they There's had a bunch to of, have. The yeah. bodies never washed up. You yeah. know? Um, the sightings seem legit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm, you know, rooting for them. Because they, I don't feel like none of those guys were really in there for, a, you know, bad reasons. Like the Anglin brothers were in there for, you know, they were they were arrested for burglary in Alabama and Florida. And uh, they just kept trying to escape from jail until they finally landed themselves in Alcatraz. So mm -hmm. I'm glad they finally were able to pull it off. <laughs> well, that's the kind of prisoners that would end up there is uh, people who were just not obeying the rules at other prisons or people who tried to escape from prison. Nobody like, was actually, nobody actually went to court and was sent to Alcatraz. That would only be for inmates that were coming from other jails and they would eventually transfer them into Alcatraz. Right. But I, I'd have a hard time rooting for like a murderer, you know, or somebody like, you know, grosser than a burglar. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, but it, the, these kind of crimes like breaking out of prison, I feel like these are the rare crime that you're rooting for the criminal. You're like, Oh, I hope they make it. You know, I hope they don't get caught. Uh, but obviously you don't want some psychopath uh, back out on the streets. And um, how do you like plan this for months and months and months and months? And there's supposed to be four of you. And the main guy who plans it, like this dude puts everything together, doesn't take the time to make sure he can get the vent off the night of the escape. Mm -hmm. What are we doing so, here? <laughs> a few things about this guy. So I believe that was Alan West. And he claimed that he was the mastermind of the whole plan. I wonder if he really was. A lot of people speculate that Frank Morris was actually the the mastermind behind it because he was the smartest of all three. IQ or all like four. 133 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was he was likely the brains behind the operation. I wonder if Alan was like, screw it, these Much guys are like gone anyways. Here. I'm just yeah, gonna I get it. I'm just gonna take credit. Yeah, so smart. Uh so he just decided to take I, I feel like he just decided to take credit for the whole thing because he was the one who didn't get away. But it's like, dude, if you were the smartest one, maybe you should have figured out that your freaking vent wasn't. Yeah, ready there's to no way he was a smart. Like, how do you? I mean, it's just the the most minor details. I would be checking that thing like every night. Like, can I get it off? Am I gonna be able to get out of here? Can I get? Can I move it? Mm -hmm. And this dude's just like, ah, got this spoon. It ain't working. And it yes. shows how loyal they all were to each other because you'd think you make it out, you climb up the pipes, you climb out the vent, you're on the roof, ready to go, and they're like, oh, where's Alan? And they actually went back for him. And that's that's impressive because at that point I'd be like, all right, forget it, we're going. You know, he's not here, he's late, we're leaving. And he actually went back and tried to help him get the vent off. I guess there was um, a a bar that was put across the vent um, that they didn't notice before, so he couldn't get it to to budge because of the uh, metal bar that was there. But eventually, he did apparently get it to budge, and he did crawl out and make his way outside. But by then, the men had the other three had gone. And um, they left him. So the, the style of raft was like a pontoon style. And I guess that means it's like several pieces that you can put together to create one big raft. But there were four pieces. Each man would have held a piece. So they actually left him his piece of the raft so he could try to get across himself. And they left him a paddle um, and a life vest. So he could have tried it. But I think at that point, he either didn't want to try it on his own or uh, he just didn't feel like there was enough time to get away because the, the the most important part of this uh plan was the head start that they would have because they would have hours to get away from authorities before they caught on to the fact that the guys were even missing every other plan was like all right we saw it through this window let's make it down to the shoreline and make a break for it and then you know they get caught right away they get shot as they're swimming away or something so that that raft was like the most useful friendship bracelet of all time. <laughs> <laughs> all together now. Uh, yeah, there are pictures of authorities pulling a raft from the water, and I even included that in the episode. But I think that never happened. As far as I've read on multiple sources was that they never actually found the raft. Um, so I wonder 
what that picture is or if that's authentic or if that was just kind of a um a recreation of what happened it wasn't the raft that they left for their buddy i don't think so where'd it go then the raft that they left for his buddy who just stayed on the roof yeah it stayed on the roof he never oh. left the oh, roof right, right, right. which i think is kind of off. dumb too like dude i'm leaving like i'm yeah. it's a mile and a half risking it Right. Like, and I, this I is, know it's this not is, easy, but yeah. We're, well, we're a lot of people think that this is an unswimmable thing, but they actually do. Every year they have a swim. And it's right, just these are trained, um, like there triathlon a, athletes with sure, equipment but also and training like, and whatnot. And they're not like in prison gear in the middle of winter, whenever this mm -hmm. it was in February, right? Yeah. Uh, I think so. No, June. June. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, hundred percent. It's like no. I mean, either way, it's still cold in North. I think. Carolina. I think last year there was like a ten or eleven year old girl that made the swim. So I think. I think you have. With these guys, you're going to have an additional adrenaline rush of them trying to make it to freedom. Now, there's a few theories on adrenaline on how this rush isn't going to help you in a mile and a half swim. It'll help you for the first burst, but an adre adrenaline rush lasts. When a short did you become of a swim expert? Like, who are you? It was the last time you. Yeah, yeah, last time you broke out of prison, Dave. Yeah, what have you swam from Alcatraz? Uh, I know a thing or two about adrenaline rush, oh, rushes. Oh, from yeah, I mean, I I trained MMA for an actual fight. Like, there's oh. an, an adrenaline rush lasts a certain amount of time, and then you're more gassed out after it wears off than you were if you didn't have the adrenaline rush. Dan Santos paid the price. Never forget this <laughs> great victory. Beat the bag out of that guy. I'll never forget it. Get him um, blood. Yeah, but I think if an eleven-year-old girl, uh, girl can make the swim, then I think a grown man swimming for his freedom would be a little bit more um, motivated to make that to make that swim. And I, I understand what you're saying. Where how much does adrenaline last in a mile and a half swim? I mean, your life's on the line. But there's the other theory that they were picked up by a boat. So, and I actually watched an entire documentary on this, a pretty poorly made documentary that surprisingly was narrated by Danny Trejo. And uh, I was I was surprisingly underwhelmed with the quality of this documentary, but it's available on Amazon Prime if you want to check it out. And this is a brand new theory, or it's a relatively new theory, that uh, the they had been in contact with people on the outside. Now, already, that's a red flag because people at Alcatraz were not allowed to write letters or have any contact with people outside. Um, now, they could have visitors. Certain prisoners could have visitors. They had these... Um, it's like two inch thick glass that you could talk to. Uh, you could still go see those at the prison today, but um, it was very hard for them to contact. Obviously all that kind of stuff would be closely monitored, especially if you're planning an escape, but uh, apparently guards could be bribed and they think that the guards were in on the escape as well. Um, and there was a monetary uh, value. So there was supposed to be, I guess five people were originally supposed to have broken out. Now, obviously what we covered was the four of them that were involved with the plan. Obviously three of them only escaped, but you had um, each one of them, like their families came up, I guess with 10 grand, according to this guy's deathbed confession. And this guy's theory is, or his claim was that he actually murdered all three of these inmates. So he had um, teamed up with a guy. He didn't want to kill them, but he had teamed up with a guy. They went out on a boat on the night that they were supposed to escape. They picked them up in the ocean or in San Francisco Bay and brought them back to shore where they had a truck waiting and they drove them up to Canada. And then once they were in Canada, they had secured, they had already secured like five grand just for starting it. And they were going to get another five grand when it was finished. But in total, the prisoners had collected their cash, which was about 50 grand. And as soon as they got that cash, this guy told his, his partner basically like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to kill them as soon as they get their hands on this money. And we're just going to dump them in the woods. So apparently they had driven them out to the woods. I believe it was in Canada and killed all three of them and buried them took the money and split. And this was this guy's deathbed confession. And um, I don't know how much it really holds up. I mean, they had some decent evidence. They had some letters that were written back and forth that they uh, checked on. I would check out the documentary because it is an interesting theory. But the theory is that they did actually escape. They did survive the swim. They were picked up by a boat, but then they were consequently murdered and uh, the money was stolen. So that's another theory. Dave, are you just sitting there trying to figure out how you can shoehorn in again that you trained MMA? So what's going on? Over One there? time I brought it up because you you backed me into a corner. Tell me I don't know about adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't a shoehorn. <laughs> Anyways, that story is pretty interesting. What 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 did they go off of? Just the death hit? Deathbed confession, or did they try to back the it up? Deathbed confession, effect? and um, there was 
multiple people that had backed up this guy's claim that um, they had murdered everyone. So uh, obviously he didn't want to admit to it earlier because it's murder. Uh, but he had marked the graves. Um, they had nailed horseshoes into the trees surrounding the mass grave site where they where they dumped these guys. They had already pre-dug the hole and everything. So they, wow. they had this thing planned out. I feel like that's a bad idea, but yeah, uh, why why are you marking it? Yeah, so uh, they went to explore this area that they had assumed it was, and they had a letter from a woman. I don't know if it was his mother or just someone that was connected with the uh, with the escape plan, and she had told him like you can't access it because of the bend because now they or you can't access it from the road because they put up a um a new guardrail or something. But anyways, they they had located the area that they think it was, and they actually found imprints in the trees that had surrounded the alleged place um imprints of uh horseshoes that had been nailed to the tree to mark the um the location and they found all four of the the markings with the nails still in the tree uh but they never excavated or found anything so they said that they've narrowed down the area where they think the gravesite is by about the size of a football field now but until they find something i'm not going to say that this uh theory is should legitimate. we check where the grave marker is no <laughs> yeah, just get a shovel and start digging like it couldn't have been that deep right uh dave as a trained um mma expert <laughs> fighter would you mark the graves of your murder victims i would not actually they um this this uh, Stranger Things newest season was this reminded me of that. I don't know if you All guys right. watched it. It's not a spoiler. To, are you ready to spoil that spoiler. too? It's not a spoiler. <laughs> the, the, uh, never mind. You know what? You're right. Well, no, now I gotta know what you're saying now. No, so I can't we'll... now because well, they were in the desert and they were burying the body, mm -hmm. and uh, the not one dude's like hammering in the the marker there, and they're like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "Oh, just to, you know, just to memorialize." And they're like, "We just buried a body in the desert." <laughs> <laughs> Not a good idea. <clears throat> yeah, that was a very Breaking Bad scene out of uh, Stranger Things. There, without spoiling anything, that seemed uh, they've they've uh, they've they've stepped up their crime solving to burying bodies. It was uh, interesting. Can't wait for the second half of that uh, that new season. It's gonna be fun. Do you hold? Do you think that that documentary, this part of the story we're talking about, has any truth behind it? Before we start to move away from this particular escape, I think if. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I don't think so until they find some actual evidence. Yeah. I don't, I don't think so. I think it's just, there's so many people that try to claim that they did this or that, you know, like they had so many, as soon as like the escape hit the news, they had so many fake leads and fake phone calls and all this crazy stuff. I do believe that, um, that John Anglin wrote a letter taunting the warden. I do believe that I, I do believe that they, they survived and they escaped. And I think that photo of them in Brazil is legitimate. Um, they had, uh, they had like forensic scientists test it and, uh, they have all this crazy new technology where they've, they've all but confirmed that it's absolutely them in that photo. Uh, another thing, uh, I had said 1975, I had read 1975 that the photo was taken, but the FBI files have it listed as 1965. So I may have been off by a few years, 10 years by that. Just as a little correction there. It, it didn't look like 1965 based on the photo. Um, Dave, as an MMA expert, can you help us date the year on that photo? Unfortunately, my extensive MMA training doesn't <laughs> uh, doesn't extend to that uh, level of expertise. I feel like if you're going to keep trolling Dave on these MMA jokes, you're going to have to tie it into fighting somehow, not with photography. All right. I'm going to just step it up a little bit there, Rob. All right. Well, Dave, while you were wrestling over the fact of those photos. <laughs> <laughs> well done. But the other so the other escape attempts, I think, lead more into the prison being haunted because this is just more and more people that are dying at the prison. So this was obviously um, that escape was the fun one and they may have died. But uh, if they did, it was probably in San Francisco Bay. But you have several inmates that were shot and killed. Um, at Alcatraz, and obviously the big one was the battle for battle for Al Alcatraz, where they were murdering guards point blank range. Three of the inmates who started the riot got shot and killed there. So this just adds to the death toll at Alcatraz. I think I think this is why like prisons are always going to have this haunted allure and probably always actually be haunted, especially ones like Alcatraz and like the big ones that housed like events that happen like the battle for Alcatraz or major 
just the amount of deaths and the stuff that we don't even know about that transpired in these prisons, like the hauntings have to absolutely be through the roof on almost any major prison that you that you cover. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Especially one so old and one that saw its fair share of death, whether it was escapes or there were, I think, eight murders that are documented at the prison, five suicides. Um, you had the guy who I think we'll talk about this probably in a little bit, but the guy who was apparently killed by a demon in solitary, that's a big one. And they aren't the first one. That wasn't the first account of this demon with red eyes that lurks at the prison. And then before it was even built, uh, apparently native Americans had warned the U S army, like, Hey, don't build anything on that Island that is inhabited by evil spirits. So mm -hmm. there's uh, your native American tie into it as well. Yeah. The, the whole, demon appearing and solitary and the guy just dropping dead is like a whole terrifying aspect right. to it the other theory behind that is he would not stop screaming mm -hmm. and they think maybe prison guards just went in there and strangled him like shut the fuck up and <laughs> so maybe maybe that's how he died and Dave, uh, I think did you strangle this inmate with your extensive mma training which cho <laughs> which chokehold would you have used yeah um with all of your training yes that's what we're here for What's the most effective chokehold that this guard could have used to get him to shut up, but not yeah. actually kill him? Uh, rear naked choke, probably. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Dave's stressed. All right, we're gonna stop. We're gonna stop doing this. Um, so I guess we'll go full blown and just talk about demons. Dave, you're the demonologist of the uh, of the group here. What are your thoughts here? Do you think that there's any solid evidence to say that there is a demon haunting Alcatraz? No. Well, fuck you then. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't fun at all. <laughs> no, I think it sounds like the guy just went nuts. He's in solitary confinement. And I mean, the, the whole thing about him um, coming back after he died was pretty creepy hmm. with the extra yeah. person in the count. I thought that was it pretty. Wasn't just, it wasn't just the prison guard that had reported that. I guess a bunch of the inmates that were in line saw him too. And they're like, what the hell? I think that adds, I mean, a, with multiple reports of a red eyed demon being in that area, the death that's a big one and then people seeing his ghost after i don't know if that really has anything to do with the demon but um definitely a haunting tied to it something's going on there that would be my opinion on it and the, the other the thing that like kind of separates alcatraz other than it being on the island of course like that separates it from most prisons but the life that the prison guards families had to live was also pretty rough because a lot of them lived on the island. There was like mm -hmm. a whole housing barracks for them. So they're kind of like forced to stay on this island most of the time and pretty much like trying to go to an island now, right? If you're not flying in, if you're trying to ferry back and forth, it's a nightmare as it is because they're canceled all the time. And like just what these families had to go through living on the island itself was probably you know, misery. Cash yeah, that comment. Basically, sorry, <laughs> cash this. Those poor guards, they kept having to worry about enemies dropping into their AO. So we've got a lot of comments in chat, which is joking about the Call of Duty map, <clears throat> Rebirth Island for listeners that play Call of Duty. Obviously, you've spent lots of time on Alcatraz because that map is a spitting image of resurgence. Yes, sorry, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> it's resurgence. Back. <laughs> says it's resurgence. That's why he came back. For people that don't understand Call of Duty in this certain game mode that it takes place on Alcatraz, uh, when you die, as long as your team stays alive, you come back like 30 seconds later. That's a, that's a solid Call of Duty joke there, but that's the extent of Call of Duty that we'll talk about here on this. Back to the, um, the, the uh, prison guards having to live on the island. Um, it's like it's like they're one of the prisoners, um, as Rob was saying, pretty much. And they, I knew this prison guard once who he wasn't a prison guard in Alcatraz, obviously, but he um, was a prison guard here in Massachusetts. And he was saying that um, he's like, I used to I used to tell these prisoners, he's like, you're going to get out of here sometime. I'm never getting out of here. And he's like, he's like, I'm basically serving a life life sentence. And that was his like extremely negative outlook on his job. He's like mm. all these kids, all these guys that are coming in and out of here. They're all they're all leave someday, and I I know. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, an entire true. entire book written actually um, on it was called the Children of Alcatraz Island, and I was like, what the hell? Is, what could this be about? And it, oh, sorry, I punched my microphone. Uh, I was like, what could this be about? And it turns out it, it's about the children of the guards that lived on the island. So they had that, and the warden's house is actually pretty sick as well. 
What are we laughing at? What happened? I, I, had, I had a I joke just, ready, and I'm just no, not going to do it. I was going to ask you, you, you if Dave to. taught you how to throw that punch. <laughs> ah, there you go. He's been waiting. He's been waiting. I saw you. I saw you. I saw the gears turning when Dave was telling the story about his friend who worked at the prison. I knew you were going to miss. Oh, did, you guys to... trade, did you guys train together with MMA? I mean, we have I, to let this go. I have to. Let, I'm not going to though. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but yeah, the children on Alcatraz Island, like the families living there. And when we think of these haunted prisons, we always think of the prisoners. We're like, oh, these guys spent their whole life here. They had to, you know, suffer through probably a ton of indignities, which is all true. But to Dave's point, a lot of these prison guards are going through hell day after day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot of them get to go home at night, but these ones... I guess went home, but their home was 50 feet away in some barracks where the housing conditions probably sucked just as bad. I yeah. mean, John, not as bad as a prison, but they weren't probably anything, you know, great. Right. I think a lot with this prison, especially with the layout of it and the fact that you're on this island, you're overlooking San Francisco Bay. It's actually like an absolutely gorgeous view. Um, but you can see San Francisco from the island, right? right. And you just see freedom and you see life in a you know, a busy city just right there. And I think that, I mean, I don't know what the percentage was compared to other prisons at the time of how many prisoners escaped from Alcatraz or attempted to escape. I don't know if it was a heightened number, but I would feel like when you're getting teased and you could see freedom in this gorgeous city right across this bay that you'd be like, dude, I, I, I like, like, I feel like people would be more prone to try to escape just because they could see it. Um, but I guess few there wasn't too, too many cells that you could really have a nice little ocean view from your cell. And even the prison yard, uh, there was obviously massive walls and you can't really, you can't see anything from the prison yard as well. Um, oops, that's not the one I was trying to share. Matt Thomas just got here. So I just got back from my kid's ball game. Did I miss the part where a medium showed up and made things worse? No, we've established that Dave will take care of any mediums with all of his extensive MMA training throughout the episode. Exactly. Uh, there was actually several Medium martial arts. That's what it stands for. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Medium martial arts. <laughs> that's solid. Uh, there, there actually was uh, mediums that showed up, and um, one of them had identified a ghost that called himself the Butcher. And if you go back into the history of Alcatraz, there was a murderer who stayed at Alcatraz who was called the Butcher. Again, the medium easily could have looked up that information before saying that they're hearing from the butcher it's one of those cases again but i don't know if uh i mean maybe the hauntings got worse after mediums have been there but plenty have been there and they're uh also uh not shy from allowing people to investigate there's been a lot of uh big tv shows i don't think it's as easy as other locations just to go there and do a paranormal investigation it's obviously extremely busy with tourists i believe the number was 1.3 million tourists every year at least go there so yeah that's a lot that's a lot so to find time and non-busy areas to do a paranormal investigation obviously you'd have to set up something to do something privately at night um i don't know if they do they might actually do some of that um assassin asked what's the the story about the ghost girl or woman in the hall that was mentioned in the early story uh, so this is a story from the warden who actually was a skeptic and didn't really believe in ghosts. And he had heard the wailing of a woman, like a woman crying, and he explored and found it in the walls. And actually, he was with a group of people at the time, and they also heard the crying coming from the walls. Uh, Dave, do you have more on that? And Dave, once again, wrote the opening story. Yeah, so that I based that on the... Um on the, the true event of the warden who was a skeptic, like you just said, who actually ended up hearing it himself in person and was like, Oh, wow, there it is. And nobody could explain it. There were other people. He was actually giving a tour was the real story uh, of the building and um, him and the whole tour. They heard the crying in the walls and they couldn't figure out where it was coming from, which is pretty wild. That is wild. Yeah. And, I believe the earlier story would have been a, a different warden, but in uh, 1940, there was a party at the warden's house, which is now same a shell. Sh was it the same warden? Yeah. So yep. this, uh, the house is like a shell of what it used to be. It looks like it, there must have been a fire or something that absolutely destroyed this house. But um, for those Warzone players, it's grandma's house. That's what we call it. But this is the warden's house. And uh, this one is. Um, I, I don't know if the warden himself saw this ghost, but I know that there were several guards that saw this ghost. It was basically 
the ghost of a man. Uh, he had a handlebar mustache. He was wearing a gray hat and a gray suit. And he showed up and just stood there staring at them. And he was there for almost a full minute. And then the uh, temperature dropped and uh, the fire in the Ben Franklin fireplace. I don't know if there's a specific kind of fireplace, but the book was oddly specific on it. So that's what I called it. Uh, the fire went out the same time that the ghost disappeared, which is pretty, uh, pretty cool. Did you find anything on the Birdman of Alcatraz and his hauntings? I don't know if the Birdman actually haunts the place, does he? Uh, I, I know the story of the Birdman of Alcatraz. Go ahead. Yeah, I only found um, one couple that was visiting in 1994 claim that on their way to his cell, they heard like canaries chirping. Okay. And then when they got to his cell, they saw him quickly reading a book in in his cell before he disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if there's multiple sightings of him, though, but that would be an interesting one because he's so synonymous with Alcatraz. Alcatraz yeah, I didn't mention him in the episode, but Birdman of Alcatraz, I believe, was the inmate who stayed at the prison longer than anybody else. And he collected birds. He was allowed to have birds in these cages until they found out that he was smuggling contraband and messages back and forth with the birds. And then I believe he got those privileges taken away. His yeah, whole story is very interesting and we won't get into it. I'm actually shocked Jesse's um, eight hour intro didn't cover it. But uh, one, of the, one of the things I had to shave out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, go look up his story. There was like a there's a movie made about him. There was Hollywood actors trying to get him out of prison until they found out that he was just really not a good person. Mm, he had yeah. an IQ of 134 and ate with his fingers. Mm. Well, does that have to do with him being in prison? No, it's just weird that somebody with a really high IQ would eat with their fingers. I just thought well, it was an interesting fact. That is a strange fact. I actually don't even know how to make a joke out of that. So well done, Dave. Yep. Uh, <laughs> well, what if he was eating chicken wings? That makes sense. Or corn on the cob. Um, I don't think that would be worthy of note. So why would I be reading about it? That's a good point. You know, what's funny is on the um, in the thumbnail image of this episode, probably talking about soup. I have a <laughs> just <laughs> <the scene. laughs> on the thumbnail image of this uh, of the Alcatraz. I actually put a giant picture of the Birdman or Alcatraz's face, but didn't even talk about it in the episode. So I'm glad we talked about him now. Well, you're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, there are plenty of books written about this, um, and and there are several about the hauntings. There was also a movie that I almost watched today on the haunting of Alcatraz, but the movie looked really bad. So I didn't oh, watch it. We should have definitely watched it then. Those are the best. <sighs> I don't know. Yeah, it just didn't look scary at all. But that, I'll that's... take your word for it. You're the horror movie expert. Yeah, no, that yeah. I, well, I am, Dave. I mean, not all of us are MMA experts, but I at least know my way around a horror movie. Um, <laughs> my next question that I just completely lost in that train of thought of having to make fun of Dave, I'm gonna save it until I remember it. So uh Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Worth worth mentioning for sure. So that other interesting one was there was a uh uh the report of like cannon fire and gunfire. We've heard that in quite a few episodes, which is interesting because the cannons at Alcatraz were never fired at an enemy. I'm sure they were fired maybe in training exercises, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a strange uh thing to hear. I guess gunshots would be a, a something that you could hear as plenty of people were shot at Alcatraz for sure. But, um, but I guess sometimes these, these disembodied sounds, I mean, I guess wouldn't be disembodied, but the sounds of gunshots happening. And then they would also hear disembodied screams that go along with them were so loud that some of these guards would just hit the deck because they thought they were under attack, but there were no gunshots. There were no guns. There were no bullets. There were, they weren't actually under attack. It was just kind of a ghostly paranormal event, uh, that was, uh, apparently so loud that they felt they had to uh, be defensive. So that's a, that's one of the more interesting hauntings that I've heard. Cause you hear these hauntings a lot, especially in like Gettysburg and different places like that, where they hear the sound of gunshots in the distance. Um, and they attribute it to ghostly gunshots, but you never hear them so loud that, you know, you duck and hide. Well, to go back to the cannons, one of the things we talked about on the USS Salem is it technically was never a warship, but they ran a ton of exercises, right? And they, mm -hmm. they fired everything and stuff. And I think like when you even firing a cannon just in a training exercise is such like a memorable moment. You know what I mean? Like because you're firing a cannon. So Could lead for to me, residual hunting. 
so like for me, I'll never forget throwing a grenade, right? Like I did it one time and that that moment will always stick with me. And if you're on Alcatraz all the time and you fired a cannon, that might be like your greatest memory of Alcatraz, right? You were so excited to fire that cannon. Andrew says they're probably just cluster strikes. We can't get away from the war zone jokes. You today. have to. You have to. <laughs> I hey, can't you gotta, imagine. You got to get away from the MMA jokes, all right? I'll no, get away from that the war makes zone sense. Jokes. War zone jokes like, is appealing to about three people in our audience. I just wonder how Rob's going to find another way to shoehorn the fact that he got to throw grenades in the army into the episode. I wonder how you're going to fight out of the fact that I've been funnier than you this entire episode. I'm not trying to be funny. You're trying. You have to try. I don't I'm just naturally try. funny. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, are you kidding? Uh, <laughs> we we can move on. We can move on from that. Um, any any ghost stories that came out of Alcatraz that uh that you guys think stood out among the rest? Um, you talking about Al Capone so that we can't post this on TikTok again. That's true. I I was I, I was like I can't avoid it because it's he's obviously the most infamous uh inmate that stayed there. But I knew what I was getting myself into. No, and I do, I, I do yeah, find I, that interesting because he is so prominent and the fact that he's tied to so many locations and several different prisons. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like this guy got moved around and I still find that story of him like crying at night and like begging Jimmy to forgive him is 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 haunting. It is interesting because at this point, I mean, he's losing his mind anyways. And we talked about this on the um the Valentine's Day Massacre episode with the Iroquois Theater, the Chicago episode. And we had mentioned that at this point in his, in his life, he was losing his mind and it would never get better. Obviously, he had syphilis for an ungodly amount of time. And when you don't treat that, I guess it uh, destroys you physically and mentally. Uh, but the fact that he was naming the ghost as Jimmy, who was one of the guys who was killed in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, um, the fact that this ghost that was supposedly haunting him had a name that that makes it uh, a little more interesting. And then the other haunting with um, Al Capone that a lot of people say they hear is the sound of banjo music playing. And I read some interesting reports that I really do want to address is that they were saying you can hear the banjo coming from his cell. Now, I was reading other things that said that he strictly was not allowed to play banjo in his cell. As I had mentioned earlier, this was the maximum security, minimum privilege penitentiary to where you had to earn the rights to have an instrument. Part you of you can't the, just send the guy into his jail cell with guitar strings. All right, There's, that does sound for dangerous. obvious reasons. Yeah, but some of these, but a lot of inmates did play the guitar. In fact, um, if you go back to the uh, Anglin brothers, they used a, an acoustic guitar to cover up the vent um, while they were digging away at it and stuff. So they they did have guitars and they did have um, instruments. And obviously they ordered an accordion, which was used as a pump to uh, keep the raft afloat as well. So there were definitely instruments there, but you had to earn that privilege. And uh, not to go back to the escape attempt, because we obviously had too much of that. But these guys had way too many privileges to a point where I do think maybe the guards were involved, where they were allowed to go work in certain areas that they needed to escape from. They're like, oh, I think that roof needs some paint. And they go up and they loosened the air vent cover and everything from from there. And they're like, oh, there's too much dust. We need to put up curtains. So they put up curtains and built like a, a factory or like a little laboratory where they would construct all their handmade drills and all this. And they, they had their own little workshop. So uh when they say minimum privilege obviously these guys must have been model inmates uh before their escape obviously to be able to earn the privilege to do all these things but back to al capone and his banjo the reason that i find it strange is they were saying oh al capone wasn't allowed to practice banjo in his cell so he had to practice it in the showers and they were saying that he feared that if people saw him practicing the banjo they'd kill him and then they were like but he had to practice it because he played in the jail banjo band and I'm like, if he doesn't want people to see him play the he, banjo, then why the fuck would he be in a banjo band? He was playing. He had to play his banjo in the showers because he was afraid that if he was in the um, the the recess yard outside, that he would be killed. Not for playing the banjo, but because he's Al Capone. So oh, he, instead okay. of going out for free time outside, then he would go um, into the showers and practice his banjo by himself instead. Okay. What a, what a life. Like, that just sucks. I know. The contrast of before prison and in prison for his life must have been pretty wild. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. But so uh, 
the reports of banjo playing have been heard. And um, they also say you can hear it uh, faintly in the showers as well. So a little banjo haunting for you. First, that's the first on Hometown Ghost Stories is a banjo haunting. We, we have horrible. talked about a haunted guitar before, but this is the haunted music of a banjo. We have. I forgot all about it until you brought it up. But yeah, we yes. have talked about the haunted guitar. Um, I think that kind of covers it. I highly suggest that people go and look at the conditions that the prisoners and the guards alike and their families had. Um, we could talk about stuff not haunted related about Alcatraz for like five different parts. You know, like it's oh, there's so sure. much there's so much to it. But I, I just would say if you're really interested in it, go look up some of the uh, conditions that they lived in and how that probably pertains to this place being haunted. Yep. Uh, I got a lot of my information for this one from the uh, Escape from Alcatraz book. It's a short read. It's a good read. Uh, knocked it out pretty quickly. And I got the book as well. And because it's such a short and quick read, it is a um, disappointingly thin book. So it doesn't look great on the bookshelf, but it's a, it's a good read. So if you guys want to check that out, and I just want to credit some of the work there. Uh, sounds like you should have been practicing MMA. Absolutely. Uh, after your after your podcast Friday about Jesse James, I'm going to try to find out any info if there's any haunted areas in St. Joseph, the town where Jesse James was killed in. Uh, yeah, thank you, Demon. We had actually talked about, um, we were curious about if the place that he died was haunted, and we actually, I actually hadn't looked into that for the episode, so I would love any information on that. Definitely send that over uh, if you get it. Yeah, that's Alcatraz. That's uh, That was a whole lot to tackle. And um, there are several stories that we didn't really touch on there, but that'd be a, a fun one to visit for sure. What are you laughing so what's at? What's next week? You're next week. Oh, I'm next week. That's right. What's uh, next yeah, week? Dave? So next week, next week we're, <laughs> we're sticking. We're staying in California. We're doing Modesto, California. There's a whole bunch of hauntings over there and some pretty cool history. Perfect. So this was kind of San Francisco. This is obviously just Alcatraz, which I don't even know if it's considered San Francisco, but it's in San Francisco Bay. Um, San Francisco I, is, a, is a very haunted place. So we'll definitely be doing an episode on San Francisco, too. Yeah, I think it's definitely considered San Francisco, like because anyone that talks about Alcatraz refers to it as being San Francisco. So I think right. I, I think we're safe be. with that. Yeah, but I definitely plan to return and do a um, San Francisco episode as well. Yeah. Then what, um, we can, uh, what do we got coming up the next week? So we're going to be going back to an island after Modesto. So this kind of ties into me and Dave's episode. We're going to be going to Block Island, Rhode Island, which is very weird to say. But Block Island is sort of a vacation resort area um, in New England. It gets often overlooked because Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are the two bigger ones here. But there's a lot of haunted history on the island, and I will be going out there tomorrow to get some footage of everything. And um, they do ghost tours on the island, and one of the ghost tour companies is going to be meeting me to show me some of the places, which is pretty mm. cool. By the way, email them back if you haven't already. I just saw they sent you a confirmation email. Uh, but that is that. And then this Friday, we're going to drop our latest horror movie review covering uh, The Descent and The Final Girl which were final, was final girls. girls. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it was plural. Uh, so we're going to knock that out. It'll be available for everybody on Patreon tomorrow for all our patrons. And uh, then for everybody else on Friday, uh, speaking of our patrons, uh, I want to thank uh, Brandon W, Sarah W, Soph M, Hooper, Jake V, Stephanie A, Seth, Dave sucks W, Captain McSlugs and Sarah R. We have a whole lot of W's. Not well, entirely our family. There are several of our family members in there, but a lot of W's for the last names and uh, patrons. So thank you guys so much for that. I got uh, one review that I want to read that we got. We got a ton of reviews, uh, a lot of five stars this week. So thanks, everybody, for that. This one is from Darth DG, titled Love the Show. Found out about the show while listening to Chris Jericho's podcast and instantly went to check the show out, being a huge paranormal fan. Very entertaining podcast. The boys are hilarious, and the backstory and historical info on all the locations is very cool. I'm making my way down all the episodes right now, but if you guys haven't, please do an episode on San Diego. Just to name a couple, we have some infamously haunted locations like Elfin Forest and the Whaley House. Cheers. Well, that's you interesting. Obviously, we covered the Whaley House, but I did not cover that forest. So yeah. that is cool. Haunted Forest is always fun to cover. Fun to cover for ghost stories, difficult to investigate, but 
that won't stop us when we go to the Freetown State Forest in the upcoming Bridgewater Triangle episode that we haven't started on yet, but we will. That was originally planned for this month, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> Things come up for sure. Um, okay, so uh, that is pretty much it. So join us on uh, on Friday. Check us out. If you haven't already and you want to have your review read on the show, Swing by iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and drop us a five-star review. Leave a comment, and we will read it on air. For anyone that is also interested, again, uh, swing on over to Patreon, and you can earn some cool perks and get your name in the credits. That'll pretty much do it, gentlemen. Any, uh, anything else? No, that's about it for me. Cool. All right, then. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll catch you next week. See ya. Peace. Hey guys, I'm Jesse Wilkins from Hometown Ghost Stories. I want to thank you so much for watching this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed it, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can see when we go live again. Also, if you're interested, please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. Uh, the link is in the description below. Lots of cool perks. You can get your name in the credits, customized videos. Join us on the live stream. Uh, lots of cool stuff there. So head on over to Patreon. Check out Hometown Ghost Stories. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook. All the links are available below, and we'll see you guys next time for another episode of Hometown Ghost Stories.